Today we've got another obscure weapon. What is it? Hi folks, Matt Easton here and Gavin Locke, both of Scholar Gladiatoria. <laughs> and um, so Gavin's visiting today, doing a few things with me. We're preparing for a cool uh, armoured fighter event with Toby Capwell and co coming up in a week and a half. But whenever he comes over here, as you guys, if you're regular viewers will know, I often say to Gavin, Gav, if you've got anything interesting, throw it in the car and bring it over. And so he has, and here it is. So this is, as you can see, uh, a pole arm, isn't it? A very long type, so it's a type of, uh, well, it's an evolution of the spear, isn't it? Tell us what it is, Gavin. So it's a corsec. Corsec, that's right. So uh, a, a word that is clearly not from the English language. Where do we think it's from? So there's various uh, different ideas, as there always is with pole arms. Lots of different people have opinions, but it's possibly due to people think it came from Corsica. Mm -hmm. um, but with pole arms, as you know, lots and lots of people call them lots and lots of different things. Many but, theories, yeah. And yeah. Uh, if you look online uh, or uh, even in books, in fact, on arms and armour, you will see sometimes this weapon referred to by different names. I noticed actually uh, doing a little bit of uh, research online that some people have equated this with a runker. Now, it's my belief, having studied the treatises, that this is not a runker at all, because if we look at uh, Morozzo, for example, the roncone, um, or Ronka is a is a bill, I think. So a completely different type of weapon, although it does have a hook element to it. So we'll probably come back to that in a bit. So could you tell us about its features? I can indeed. So it's a pole arm on a shaft. Should we it's, take it closer to the, the camera is, so you guys yeah. can see a bit clearer? There we go. Let's do it sideways. It's a bit difficult to get pole arms on camera, <laughs> as you can see. There we go. So yeah. the shaft is almost certainly a replacement, probably Victorian or later, but the Corsac itself is 16th century, possibly 17th, but most likely 16th. Um, you have various different elements. You have a, a quite thick four-sided spike. It's square section, yes. isn't it? So that's an important part, part to note about this spike, is the top spike is a bit like an Alspice, or it's a bit like certain types of halberd top spike in the 17th century which don't have uh, blades, as it were. They don't have a, a you know, a, a sort of lozenge or flattened diamond cross section like uh, certain earlier blades do. Uh, this is absolutely square. So we're talking about pure penetration here, thrusting mm. only, no chopping, no cutting. And it's very long and thin, really, isn't it? It's a bit yeah. like a, well, it's just a spike. Yes. And it actually, you can see the reinforced runs down across this section, which you might not be able to catch up on film but it's quite reinforced here, so it's clearly designed for poking into things quite hard. Yeah, if we just show the cross section, you might be able to see that way. So it's, mm. it's, as, it's as wide this way as it is this way, and that continues down into the blade here. So this is really quite a thick cross section. Uh, it's not flat in any way. If we, if we cut through this with, a, with an angle grinder, you would have two blades here either side, but the center section is still square, and that continues yeah. into the socket. And you've mentioned the blades, and these are quite interesting. So these are backward-facing blades. This section is blunt, this section is sharp. Which is very interesting, because you might assume yeah. that the inner face here, like a bill, would be uh, like a sickle, um, or a bill hook would be edged on the inside here, which it isn't on this particular example, but they are edged here, aren't they? Yeah. And I think potentially because you can push that, you can push that into your opponent. Mm. You've also got these strengthened hooks here. So it's flat section there and then it swells out into the hooks, mm. which are obviously designed for pulling things or hooking into your opponent or hooking behind their legs. And I think, you know, some people might look at this uh, a picture of one of these and think that that's a little bit like a, a war pick or a war hammer, maybe for striking. And not to say you couldn't strike with it, but actually, if you know anything about levers and physics, uh, you will see that anything hitting there, the energy is going to go down this direction where it doesn't have anything supporting it behind here. So I don't think you're really going to penetrate much no. at all with that, even if you hit something really, really hard. Shafted weapons like this, they tend to flex more than something which is shorter, like a warhammer or an axe. Mm. So when you've got a long shaft coupled with a relatively slender head and you've got this curve here, I don't think that is going to have a lot of hitting force. So uh, if you're thinking that this might be for attacking helmets or, you know, piercing armour, I don't think so at all. I don't think that stands any chance uh, of piercing. Possibly male, but nothing more than that. So really, this is about hooking, isn't it? Hooking, and as I said, potentially using these to, to thrust at something mm. because mm. they're sharpened. And then you've got the langettes that go down the side. Yeah, and they are broken off. So originally, as Gavin mentioned, so when you see in museums or even in books, 
examples of pole arms or shafted weapons, hafted weapons, which have a wooden shaft on them. It's very, very rare that the shaft is original. The shafts are yeah. almost always later replacements because obviously if you want to put something in a museum or in a stately home, a castle on the wall, just putting the head up wouldn't be very impressive. <laughs> yeah. So you want to put it on the shaft. So we mustn't, if we just put this, if we come back, Gavin, and look at the length of this, we mustn't make any assumptions about the length of this based on this wooden shaft. Even if it were a wooden original wooden shaft, often they would be chopped off at the bottom as well. So as it happens, I think this is probably about the right yeah. length for this kind of weapon. So total length is, is maybe about eight feet, yeah, something like so, that. Yeah. So um, if we look at George Silver's uh, treatise, uh, Paradoxes of Defense, he talks about the length of various pole arms relative to where you can reach. And I think uh, I can't reach to the top of this, but that seems to be mm. about right for a weapon which is going to have obviously stabbing but also hooking potential to it. Yeah. If you made it much longer, I think it would be too unwieldy for this type of weapon. And if we look at partisans and bills, this is, or halberds even, you know, things which have a lateral motion and a stabbing motion they are very often this kind of length. Um, now there are differences in tendencies geographically, even with something like a partisan or a halberd, we find that if you look in one area, if we look in art, for example, you can see they're longer than in other areas. Same thing with pole axes. So it could have been of various lengths, um, but there we go. We'll never know, will we? But let's just have a quick look at those langets again, if we come back towards the camera. So what are langets for? So langets are these long strips and they are one piece, they're not separate, they are forge welded um, on so originally they were separate, but they're forge welded onto this socket and you can see the socket is Octagonal maybe no, it's more than that. I think it's got ten maybe ten sides yes. one two three four five. Yes, yeah, so ten sided socket with facets very nice looking you can see they go all the way around here and then coming down from the sides here pro almost certainly forge welded on are iron langettes uh, and what are langettes for Gavin? Well, langets stop, uh, in theory, add to a bit of strength. So if you're putting any kind of pressure at the top, it will add a bit of strength down the shaft. But also it means that if someone is cutting at your pole arm, it's less likely to damage it or, or put it out of action. Yeah. And they're always near the top because that's the bit that's going to be nearest the enemy's sword or yeah. the person you're attacking. And you know what? People often talk about, can you cut through a spear shaft with a sword? And they get fixated on swords. But actually, the biggest risk to pole arms is other pole arms <laughs> uh, because obviously what they're mostly going to be fighting against are other pole arms and we'll talk about that in a second in reference to the shape of this head um, so the problem actually one of the problems with pole arms hitting other pole arms and we see this with pole axes even in training is not necessarily cutting through the shaft it's mm. just snapping yeah, it isn't it force. and having this additional uh, joinery essentially attachment point surface area of attachment between the head and the shaft hopefully increases your chances of the head not flying off yeah. and this particular region for lots of reasons to do with inertia but also where you hit other weapons around here is mostly where pole arms break isn't it yeah. in use so it's, just it's also worth really noting actually sorry to interrupt yeah. but the langets are also um, it hasn't been brilliantly done on this shaft but they are embedded they don't stick out mm. so they, yeah. they have tried to as they were on the originals often in, they, they're yeah. inside the silhouette of the main. Yeah, pole. that's a really good point. And just to sort of illustrate that, let's see if we can have a close up there. You can see, so they've actually cut in, probably with a uh, chisel, um, slots for the langets to sit into. And often when we see replicas, like reenactment mm. pole, pole weapons, the langets are just nailed or screwed to the outside of an otherwise flat shaft. If we look at period pole axes, halberds, and things like this, corsac as Gavin says, they're embedded. And I think one of the reasons for that is because it makes it a yeah. lot nicer to handle. Basically, and, yeah, and you can move your hand yeah. far more easily. Up it's a real problem with replica pole axes actually where the langets sit up, up yeah. proud of the wooden shaft because you're forever ramming your uh, finger <laughs> yeah. into, the, into the langets. So user experience, uh, this is way, way better, a lot, yeah. a lot better. Um, now in terms of the shaft, this is probably the last thing to say about the shaft. We don't know what the original cross section of the shaft was. No. It could have been rectangular, it could have been round, it could have been octagonal, whatever, hexagonal. But my assumption, if I was doing a replica of this with Windlass or whoever else, given that that has mm. a 10 sided uh, faceted socket, I would personally make it a 10 sided yeah. faceted shaft because I think it's most likely from an aesthetic point of view that the flat planes of the shaft would have continued up into this socket. 
and I think that would look nicest. And one of the advantages to facets is it helps you with the alignment of the uh, extensions or yeah. appendages to, to the pole arm. So if That's, you want to hook something, knowing which direction the hook's in is really useful. Especially as these are quite flat sections, so mm. it doesn't take much for them to be off, off the true, whereas if it was just the spear itself, the spike, it wouldn't really matter. Yeah. So um, let's talk about the head a little bit. So first of all, the long, thin spike. So this is a type of spike that becomes very popular on uh, the Alchbis in the 15th century. Um, by the 16th century, uh, it starts. This type of long, thin spike starts getting added to certain other pole arms. And by the 17th century, this is probably the most common type of spike we find on halberds, which formerly had had more spear-like tips on them. Uh, and this is really geared for penetrating only, uh, but also having very long reach and punching through mail padding, um, potentially something like a, a jack, potentially something like a brigandine. Um, so it's essentially a bit like a rondel dagger blade, isn't yeah. it? It's just for penetrating stuff. It's not going to cause a huge wound. It'll be a relatively small square wound, in fact, a bit like a screwdriver, but it will be better at punching through stuff. Yeah, I agree. And then when you combine it with the fact that you have these sharp edges here, so as you're pushing forward, even if you don't stab the thing you're stabbing, yeah. you're potentially going to cause some yeah. cuts. So we've established that these are almost certainly for hooking. Okay. One question I have about this, and I, I don't actually have an opinion, and you're very welcome to post uh, theories down below. In fact, I'd be very interested to hear that, is why is, if we just bring this a bit closer to the camera for a second, why is this point a little extension with a rectangle underneath? And it must be pointed out that is almost always like that on mm. a corsac. Why don't they just make this whole end pointed? I don't know. Maybe that's better at catching things. Maybe it's snagging clothes yeah. or hooking around bridles of horses. Other, I don't know. Or maybe I'm looking from the wrong side. Maybe it's a manufacturing thing. Maybe someone like Will Sherman or Paul Binns would give me an insight into this. Maybe if you're forging out a blade like this, it's easier to just manufacture a little point like yeah. that, like a nail or a bodkin, rather than making the whole end pointed. I don't know. I don't know. So theory is about that particular shape where the point is at the top there and you've got this little heel or yeah. something, shoulder. Why is that? Last thing that I'd like to talk about like this is why do you think, Gavin, that the edges are on the top here? So I think it comes down to when you when you hold this pole arm, it's surprisingly light. Yeah. Um, you look at it and you think of maybe a glaive or something with a cutting blade and there's quite a lot of um, weight at the end. Mm. This feels far more like it's going to be moved quite agile in back and forth. Mm. And I think the reason you have these on here is it gives you almost a fencing ability as well. Mm -hmm. So you might be able to catch some, uh, someone's sword in there or someone's pole arm. But also, if you do get close enough, if you miss with this section, yeah. there's still an offensive section there that's going to slide up towards the opponent. Yeah, so there are three things, three theories that come to my mind. And I don't know, and it's not documented in any written sources as far as I know. So this is all conjecture, just based on experience with weapons and, and, and other stuff. So three things that come to my mind. Number one, as Gavin said, if you miss with the thrust, you're going to come down and essentially punch someone with a blade. Yeah. So it's a bit like punching someone with, a, with the top of an axe blade or a sword blade. So, you know, in attack, you've got another thing, another string to your bow, as it were. That's the first thing. The second thing is that potentially, if this is being used like a lot of pole arms are against people on horseback as a deterrent to mounted people that having a cutting surface there if you're stabbing at the horseman it is possible that that might cut parts of their riding equipment yeah so you know what their spurs are attached to bits of the bridle the reins i don't know it's just an idea um and of course if it hits them it's going to have more offensive purpose as well but the last one and i actually think this is probably the most important one is when you're fighting other people with pole arms mm. so one of the advantages of a winged spear like the wing spear you've often seen on my channel, or indeed something like a partisan, or any of you know any kind of trident type thing, is that one of the problems with spears. If you could just hold that for a second, Gavin. Uh, one of the problems with spears is they have a tendency of sliding past each other, which can lead to both people stabbing each other. If you've got extensions or ears or wings, whatever you want to call them, at the side, you can actually parry more effectively by stabbing into the opponent's pole arm. Now, the advantage of having this edged is it will bite into the wood especially when you're coming down it obliquely at an angle. So in other words, if, you, if someone's stabbing at you with a pole arm and you stab into their shaft and want to push it down into the ground to stand on it to then stab them or whatever, having this um, edged is going to bite in and give more yeah. control than if it was just blunt. Um, 
So yeah, so I think all of the above. Um, but they're very characteristic weapons. Now, the last thing to mention about them is I noticed that uh, various people have a theory that these are one of the Henrican uh, pole weapons. So what do I mean by that? So Henrican as in Henry VIII. So we have lots of records from Hen Henry VIII's reign, and there is a list um, which is uh, been used in various studies that have been done on pole weapons, a list of pole weapons that were in Henry VIII's collection of arms that were equipping his soldiers, for example, at the Field of Cloth of Gold or um, various other campaigns. And one of the weapons uh, that might be mentioned is, I think it's a three-grained staff, yeah. they call it. And so one theory is that this might be a three-grained staff, that the Corsac may possibly have been one of the types of weapon used in Henry VIII's reign, which is possible. Uh, there are other pole weapons uh, in there which use names which we don't necessarily know what they mean. So there's been a certain amount of uh, discussion that's gone on amongst um, academics like our friend uh, Yasson and various other people who've discussed wh what these names relate to in terms of pole arms. My personal belief is that Ronka, Ronka probably is a bill, um, Roncone, uh, whereas this could be the three going stuff, we don't know. Um, but there we go. And obviously there are other related weapons to this. This could be said to have been an evolution of the winged spear or the partisan or the Alspice to an extent. And I think it's probably not necessarily a direct descendant of any of those, but probably it's like a mixing and cross pollinization of various of those pole weapons. Anyway, Thank you very much for bringing this in, Gavin. You're Another welcome. obscure weapon for the Obscure Weapon series. If you haven't watched the other videos in this series, go and check them out now. It's in a playlist. And uh, who knows what Gavin will bring next time. You'll have to wait and see. But Gavin, thanks again for joining me. Thanks again to everyone for watching. I hope I see you back on the channel really soon. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.